Yeah, hi. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. I, I see thumbs up from some of the videos. Hello. Hi. Uh, well, welcome everybody to this kind of unique format of the uh, Dr. and Mrs. Gary Brummer Colloquium Series in Psychology. Um, we are, you know, really, um, uh, we benefit from this awesome series that lets us have speakers um, from this university and from other universities across the country come in and talk. And, um, you know, given that everybody's kind of locked down in one place, not locked, locked down like we were a few months ago, but um we've got this format and uh it's i think going to be just as informative and just as neat and in fact opens up some cool opportunities like you guys can send some questions so thanks everybody for attending um let me go ahead and begin with the introduction so it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight um the murray uh state university psychology department's own Dr. Paula Waddill. Um, Dr. Waddill has studied human learning and memory since the late 1980s. She earned her PhD from Purdue University in Psychological Sciences with a concentration in learning and memory, and her interests particularly emphasize the factors that affect how people store information and how well they later remember that information. Now, in addition to this, she's also interested in the practical applications of her research and how that applies to areas like teaching and learning. So in addition to her many publications and presentations, she also conducts workshops for students and teachers on how to apply learning and memory research to the classroom. Now, Dr. Waddell has been a member of the faculty here at Murray State University for over 25 years and is currently serving as the chair of the Department of Psychology. So she's been recognized for her many contributions to Murray State uh, and its students, including having earned the Regents Award for Teaching Excellence and the University's Distinguished Mentor Award. Her talk today is right in line with everything that I just described about her research interests. It's titled, How Will I Ever Remember All That? Strategies for Effective Learning and Memory. And at this point, I would normally invite us all to clap and welcome the speaker, but since we're all going to be muted on this Zoom call, can we all make use of the clap emoji reaction uh, and uh, join me in welcoming our speaker, Dr. Paula Waddell. Thank you, Dr. Cushion, and thank you, Dr. Brummer, who I know you are on because I did a search for you and I saw that uh, the Brummer computer is online. So I want to add my thanks to Dr. Brummer and to Sharon Brummer for, for their generous support um, of this colloquium series. We've had this colloquium series for a number of years now, and it has um, just been a wonderful opportunity for all of us to be able to hear um, about other uh, research and, and things like that in psychology. And the real focus of this colloquium is to bring psychology and psychological topics um, out to the public. So um, I'm going to do that in, that in the spirit of that this evening. Um, I'm going to be talking, as Dr. Cushion said, um, about uh, memory strategies and things that are related to um, memory, particularly as they um, help us under stress, which we are un under anyway, but nowadays we're under even more. So I'm going to be talking about um, some, some techniques and things that are, are supported by lots and lots of research done by lots and lots of people over a number of years, including by me and by my students and, and by my colleagues. So it's going to be sort of a, a summary sort of discussion, a practical discussion, because as Dr. Cushion said, I'm really interested also in the practical aspects of, of research. And I'll be talking a bit about some of the research that, that some of my students and I have done on some of these topics, but be aware that what I'm really um, going to be focusing on this evening is, is kind of a, a, a summary of that. So with that in mind, let me share my screen um, with you, okay? And um, we'll get started here. Okay. All right. And I'm going to just take a second here and drag the gallery down so um, it's out of my way. 
All right. So, um, as Dr. Cushion said, the topic is is apropos to all of us, me included, um, nowadays, which is how will I ever remember all that? What I'm going to be talking about this evening are a variety of different kinds of strategies as they relate to memory. So let me just give you a bit of an overview, um, a kind of an outline of where we're headed. And uh, I'll be talking a little bit about stress. I'll be talking about stress all the way through, but um, in, in beginning just to kind of do some introductory information about stress and then about um, memory networks, which I'll explain a bit the importance of those. And then talking about some really practical strategies, things that research has shown us, evidence-based strategies that improve our memory and um, particularly under stress. And I'm not just going to talk about them, I'm going to give you some practical ways of doing them. So these are strategies that work regardless of the kinds of things we're trying to remember. So it might be information we're trying to remember related to a course that we're taking or an exam that is coming up, but it also might be that speech you've got to give at your sister's wedding next week. Or it might be um, something else that you need to remember that's important that isn't related just to schoolwork. So these aren't strategies that are just academic. These are strategies that relate to a variety of different things. And the key here is that when we're trying to learn or study, um, the goal is to study smarter, not harder, and um, to use our time efficiently. So those four things, elaboration, interleaving, retrieval practice, and spacing, I'll be talking about each of those in turn. So let's talk a little bit about stress to begin with. And, and um, to begin with that, stress has repercussions for memory. We all know that. When you're under stress, it feels like, oh God, I just can't remember this. I'm too stressed. I can't think about that right now. Or you're trying to study, you're trying to plan, and the stress is, is taking hold. So we certainly are aware of that. And we're aware of those kinds of effects. But stress has different effects on different kinds of memory processes. And in particular, this evening, I'm gonna be talking about and focusing on um, strategies related to three different memory processes. One of them is encoding, which is getting information into memory in the first place. So obviously you can't pull something out if it didn't go in. And stress affects how well and how efficiently we get things in. And even when we're not under a lot of stress, we still have to get information into memory. So I'll be talking about encoding processes and the strategies that create more efficient, more effective encoding. Obviously, we want to get it back out. And so when we're talking about retrieval, those retrieval processes are important as well. And stress affects retrieval. We know that. You're trying to remember something and you just have brain freeze. Often when we're stressed, that is something that happens. But even when we're not, we um, are interested in those retrieval processes. And so those strategies that um, I was talking about before that I mentioned before, so encode those um, elaboration and interleaving and um, retrieval practice and, um, you know, and um, um, spacing, those have implications for encoding and retrieval. And then also another process is updating. So memories aren't static, you know that. When you um, put something in, it doesn't just sit there like a book on a shelf gathering dust. And when we add new information, we call that updating. We pull something out and we add something to it or we get, we get um, learn something new and it gets connected in some cases to um, old information. And so updating is also an important process it's one that we want to make efficient, and it's one that stress has repercussions for as well. So the strategies, again, I'm going to be talking about, nothing prevents stress from affecting our memory. Nothing is going to make our memory perfect, unfortunately. As long as we're human, we're not going to be perfect at anything. I hate to admit that to myself, but it's true. Um, but we're, we're looking at things that are going to make it more efficient and more effective. Stress has its effects physiologically. I am not going to go into all the physiology and then the brain processes and the neural systems and all that related to stress. What I'm simply going to say is we can lay the blame, not solely, but in large part to the effects of stress hormones and in particular epinephrine and norepinephrine. Sometimes they're called adrenaline and noradrenaline. 
why have one name for things when you can have more than one name for the same thing and try to remember all of those. So epinephrine and norepinephrine and then cortisol. And those hormones have different effects and different timelines. And in some cases, actually, they can be beneficial. So for example, the initial release of epinephrine and norepinephrine um, when we are faced with a stressor, mo helps to motivate, along with cortisol, our sort of fight or flight response. It helps get our body ready to address stress. It also can improve memory for things that are um, sort of encoded under that stress. With certain limitations, it tends to focus our memory and narrow our focus. But epinephrine and norepinephrine, for example, can help improve memory. Um, at least in coding. Cortisol has some effects also on encoding, but some of its biggest effects are on retrieval and they're not good ones always. So we want to be aware that when we're facing those effects on memory, they are often down to the results of brain chemistry and, and those kinds of things going on. So with that said, that's all I'm gonna say about the chemistry, but I am gonna talk, but just to be aware that's what's going on. So we know about stress. We know what stress is when we experience it, but there are lots of kinds of different sources of stress, as you know. And so um, stress occurs whenever the balance, the homeostasis is disrupted. Our body likes balance. It likes equilibrium. It likes things to be sort of the status quo. And when something disrupts that status quo, we can experience that disruption subjectively as stress. And so if something sudden and unexpected happens, it might be a tornado, for example, or it might be your cell phone ringing in the middle of the night when you didn't expect it. That can elicit stress, right? It can be your significant other proposing marriage to you when you just thought they were gonna take you out to dinner. That isn't necessarily a bad thing. So stress isn't always bad, um, but it does upset the status quo. Stress can also be things that are ongoing and long-term stress. So we may be facing financial challenges that aren't just here today and solved tomorrow, although we might wish that were the case. Um, that can create long-term stress. Relationships can create long-term stress. Social distancing can create stress. Zoom is not, I don't know about you, but Zoom is not my favorite venue for interacting with people. And so it is stressful um, to not have those contacts or those usual contacts. So stress, there's a lot of different sources of stress. And when we're trying to learn things under stress, that can be an additional challenge. But stress can also be our friend. Remember I said that stress isn't always bad. So what stress does is it alerts our brain. It gets our brain kind of revved up. Too much of anything is a bad thing. Too little of some things are a bad thing. Stress, the effects of stress is kind of like Goldilocks and the three bears, right? Too little, no good. Too much, no good. Somewhere in the middle, just right. And so we don't want to be too laid back, too relaxed if we're trying to learn something. Our brain doesn't do well in that case. It's not alert enough. We don't want to be overstressed because, again, that's not good. But a, a moderate level of arousal for most things, and while moderate is defined, varies with the difficulty of the task, is um, a good thing. So when we are trying to learn something, particularly something we may find really boring, which I'm a professor, I love my job, I love my field, I love what I teach, and I also know, and I've seen a number of you are my students, okay, I know that not everything I teach in that class, not every single topic is a burning interest to you. Maybe none of it is, okay? But you still have to learn those things for whatever reason, okay? And so again, getting that alertness can be a challenge. But if we can do that, if we can, for example, create ways of studying that are different or unusual or a little bit fun um, or out of the ordinary, that will perk our brain up so that even if we are learning something that we think is really boring, if we can do it in a way that, in a way that isn't so boring or isn't, is kind of out of the ordinary for how we usually do things, it can actually work to our benefit, okay? So let's think about this in terms of how our brain likes to store things. Our brain likes to organize things. Our brain, we like, as humans, we like everything organized. And that um, includes information. So our brain has a preference 
for organizing things and storing things in an organized way. And those organized um, organizations are often referred to as semantic networks, interconnected um, um, uh, relationships among ideas, topics, pieces of information, whatever that might be. Our brain will do that naturally, but again, when we're trying to learn things, um, particularly for classes or that speech or whatever it might be, the challenge can sometimes be um, to create those organizations um, in way when they don't immediately present them to, uh, to us, okay? Also, when we're trying to remember things, the challenge is to be able to pull out the information we're after to be able to find it effectively, accurately, and relatively quickly. Okay? And so when things are organized, when we have a network in the brain, that can help to do that. It can give us those kinds of pathways to um, get to the target information more efficiently. Think about networks like a series of roads between houses or towns. If you're just trying to get from one place to the other and there are no roads, there are no streets, there are no sidewalks, you're out there wandering in the middle of nowhere. But if you've got pathways, then you can more efficiently and more effectively get to that information. And you can do it in a quicker amount of time because you're not wandering around looking for whatever it is that you're after. So when we think about those semantic networks, that's what we're talking about here. If we just have information stored as sort of isolated items, then again, trying to find what we're after, trying to traverse that to get um, a series of ideas or a sequence of things, or trying to remember um, something for a course, or you're trying to remember those four strategies, for example, that help in memory encoding. If they're just all stored out there like isolated items, it's going to be very difficult. But if we've got connections between those, naturally occurring ones or ones that we've built ourselves, then that gives us a pathway that we can follow to get through and get around that information. Now, how do we build those pathways? The brain likes to have paths and it will organize things, but not necessarily in the most efficient way. So what do we do to do that? Well, think about the most frequent way you probably try to remember something. If you've got to try to remember, oh, I don't know, a, a grocery list, or you've got to try to remember the names of you know, um, of psychologists in a particular school of psychology, or you're trying to remember the, um, um, you know, a set of nerves for biology. What's the most frequent way you try to remember it? Be honest with yourself. Sure. You don't do anything fancy. You just say it over and over and over and over again. Rote repetition, right? So rote repetition can get information into memory. It can sort of build those memory, um, 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 representations, but it's not very efficient. Okay? In fact, it doesn't really build connections among things. It doesn't build those roads. So rote repetition is really one of the worst ways to try to remember anything if you've got to remember it for more than just a few seconds, really, let's be honest. So if rote repetition doesn't work, and that's something that most of us do, what does work? Uh, well, that brings me to the rest of the talk. So what kinds of things work to build those networks? Well, one of those strategies is called elaboration. Elaboration is when we take whatever information we need and we build on it. We take what we already know, we build on it, but we do it in a way that's new, that's different. Elaboration is sort of mentally getting our mental hands dirty with the information. So it means expanding on it in some way, not repeating it word for word. You're trying to learn definitions of things. And what do you do? You mentally just say over and over again, or you write and write and rewrite the definition out of the textbook or the definition out of your notes, which is what you copied off the PowerPoint slide in the first place, right? No. Okay. That's not elaboration. That's rote repetition. And that's not a good way to do it. But if you take that information, for example, that definition, and you think, how would I teach that to somebody else? And what I usually tell students is, how would I teach that to an eight-year-old child? Because if you've got to teach the definition, let's say, of elaboration or semantic networks or stress, to a second or third grader, you're not gonna use big fancy words like expanding and target information. 
you're going to explain it in sort of everyday kid language. It's not going to be a slick, fancy definition that sounds like it came out of a textbook, but you're going to have to think about it. You're going to have to go beyond the surface. And that is a really good way of building a network, building networks, building, elaborating between information you already know, vocabulary and language that you already use and new information. So elaboration involves expanding it. It involves organizing it. So as we're learning that information, don't assume your brain's going to organize it or the way it's going to organize it is going to be anything useful or efficient. You have control. We have control over how we organize it. And so elaboration allows us to do that. We can organize things, for example, by category. So here's an example of, say, a semantic network. You could actually draw it out. Let's suppose you're learning all kinds of things about dinosaurs. You're taking a paleontology class. I don't know. Okay. And so we're thinking about dinosaurs. And so you might organize it, for example, in terms of things like, well, what kind of dinosaurs were carnivores? Oh, for Tyrannosaurus was a carnivore, you know. What kind of dinosaurs were herbivores? Well, Stegosaur was a herbivore, those kinds of things. So you can organize it according to category, for instance. Um, what are stress hormones? That's a category. So that might be one way. Functions can be another. And again, some things may lend themselves better to functions. So what are excitatory neurotransmitters? Neurotransmitters that have excitatory functions. Instead of just that big long list of neurotransmitters, which your textbook may list in alphabetical order, not anything in any kind of thematic order, reorganize it. That is elaboration. Put it into categories. Here's some excitatory neurotransmitters. Here are inhibitory neurotransmitters, for example. Steps. So if I want to um, learn something efficiently, what would be the first thing I would do? What might be the second thing I would do? What might be the third thing I would do? Okay. And so that would be something um, that, we could, um, that we could do, excuse me, if we are trying to um, elaborate or organize. For example, in this one, there are steps. Dinosaurs. Well, people excavate, you know, um, dinosaurs. What, what do they do? They excavate. They find the skeleton. They put the skeleton in a museum. And then the museum might fund some more excavations. So there are things related to dinosaurs, for instance, that we could reorganize by putting it into meaningful order. That's elaboration. Making those connections, building those connections to related concepts. So if I am, um, you know, thinking about other things that I already know, um, you know, for example, I might have already known that a stegosaur was a dinosaur, but I didn't know it was a, a herbivore. So that is um, adding information. It's building a connection. It's also updating previous information um, that, I, that I knew, but I didn't know everything about. Relating it to prior knowledge or experiences. So that can include things like thinking of my prior experiences as examples of things that um, I am learning now. So I talked about um, rote memorization or rote repetition not being the best way to learn things. And I asked you all to think about how you generally try to learn things. And you probably thought about your prior experiences of how you study and how you rep repeated that over and over again. I did that on purpose. I did that because I, as I am doing this demonstration, this talk, I am using all these strategies that I am talking and going to be talking about. I built them into this demonstration or this talk to help you try to remember things better. Okay. Whether you like it or not, I am, that is, that is my hidden agenda here. Okay. And so when you're thinking about those experiences, those examples, then that is elaborating. Even if the book doesn't say, you know, here's an example, or your teacher doesn't say, think of an example. By spontaneously coming up with examples, tying things to your own experiences, you're elaborating. You're building those connections. Using alternate representations, including modalities. There's lots of words on this screen, but there's also a diagram. And so it could be drawing things out can be helpful. Um, sometimes if we have to remember lists of things or strategies of things, sometimes being even more creative, like putting them into songs can help. Um, and so those sorts of things, using additional modalities, I'm not talking about sort of learning styles here and all of that 
stuff that 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 um, people talk about, which the research doesn't really support very well. What the research does support is that m those if we can use multiple ways of connecting or encoding things, dual codes, triple codes, those kinds of elaborations, that helps remem us remember even better. Um, one of my graduate students, Aaron Boy Bowie and I did a, some research a couple of years ago. Aaron was looking at memory for mathematical concepts and particularly this some research related to memory for math formulas. And one of the things he had in his study, he had one group of participants, he took all of these complicated statistics formulas. So formulas for um, standard deviations and standard errors and t tests and those kinds of things and took them all apart and made puzzles out of them and um, at, had people look at the formula obviously because if you don't know the formula for a t-test you can't put the pieces together correctly but had them look at that formula and then actually learn it by physically putting those pieces together compared to the control group who just copied the formula over and over and over again and I bet you can imagine, can predict what he found. He found that later when he asked paid people a blank sheet of paper and asked them to write the formula down, the ones that had learned it by putting it together remembered that formula much better than those that had actually written it by copying it over and over and over again. When he gave them recognition tests, which one of these is the correct form of the formula that's got all the superscripts in the right place and all of the square root signs in the right place? Again, having put that formula together, helped people do much better on that than um, people that just simply copied it over and over again. So that's elaboration. Right? It doesn't just work in the lab, it works in the real world. So um, Aaron's thesis went on and thesis and then um, also presentation um, last year, Aaron worked with um, the math department here at Murray State last year um, to kind of do field research, to take this idea of elaboration into actual math classrooms. And what his, in this particular study, he worked with the math teachers um, in one, one period in their semester when students were learning to factor polynomials, okay? There's lots and lots and lots of steps to factoring polynomials. It depends upon whether it's a two-term polynomial, three-term polynomial, four-term polynomial. This isn't a math class. We're not going to worry about that. But what I want you to see is what is on the screen here is um, the steps that are involved. And this is what the teachers had normally been giving to their students. It was actually on one page. But when I put it on just one page, it became so tiny that it just looked like black dots. So I put it in two columns. But students would get a, a page, and they had to learn it. They had to learn the steps in factoring a polynomial. And there are lots of steps, and it depends what kind of polynomial you've got. So Aaron worked with the math teachers um, to sort of set up this field research, but actual teaching. So the teachers were involved as well as Aaron, and spent a week at the time of the semester, about halfway through, when they would normally be learning polynomials anyway. And um, this was an intact groups design for those of you that are interested in that design stuff, a quasi-experimental design. One class was the control group, and the other class was the experimental group. And so the control group got exactly what they would normally have gotten, which are all these steps that they had to learn, they had to memorize they had to then remember how to do. And they used that over a period of eight days in factoring polynomials. For the experimental group, what Aaron did was created a concept map. And um, the concept map took everything that was on those, that, that sort of steps and put it into an organized sequence that you can also see is color coded. So everything that's in blue is for four-step polynomials. Everything in red is for three steps. Everything that's in yellow is for two steps. Everything is gray, is common. There are, it's kind of a decision tree. Is it this? Yes, go here. If it's no, go there. And so he gave the um, experimental group this elaboration. This is organizing the steps sequentially, but also different modality, right? So it's a picture and it uses color and it uses arrows. And um, the students then learned this when they were studying it. He would give them the blank, um, the blank decision trees and they would fill it in and they would be able to check their answers and all that sort of a thing. And so um, the students did this for a week and, and used it in their classes and the other students in the control group did their lists and used that for their classes. And then a month later, 30 days later, they had a test. When they had gone on beyond polynomials and they were on to goodness knows what, they got um, essentially a surprise test, a free recall and a cube recall test of the sequencing 
for um, solving polynomials. They didn't, they didn't have to just kind of redraw everything. They were asked, okay, if you have a four-term polynomial, what do you do? How do you factor it? And as you, can, you might imagine, 30 days later, the students that had the, um, the concept map were much better at remembering what you did in the correct order than students that had simply had those steps listed in order that had copied it down. The interesting thing was there was no difference in what the steps were between the two groups. So for example, both groups were just as, as good at remembering at, you know, uh, the thing about subtract two terms that are squares. But it doesn't matter if you remember that. If you can't get it in the right order, you're never going to be able to factor a polynomial. And what Aaron found was that the students that had this elaborative technique, had used this elaborative technique, were much better at remembering what order to do it in than the other students. And the effects were even greater for students with higher math anxiety. So students that had math anxiety, which can, as you know, stress, right, um, can impede our ability to learn and remember things, this particular strategy actually helped those students even more. It helped the students that were lower on anxiety, but it had an even bigger effect for the students that, were, um, that, that had higher math anxiety. So elaboration is one way um, of, of getting in there and getting our hands dirty and doing something different with things than, um, than we would normally do. And there are all kinds of strategies that you can use. Right? Coming up with definitions in your own words, playing quiz games, you know, um, drawing pictures, doing whatever. But anything that gets it different, that is elaboration, and that's going to be effective. So that's one strategy that can help us in general, and particularly help us um, when we're under stress. Another one's called interleaving. So when we talk about interleaving, what we're talking about is actually laying, layering together multiple topics or subjects when we're studying. Now interleaving is an interesting strategy because it's counterintuitive. Right? If you're trying to learn things, let's suppose you're taking a geography class and you've got to learn about droughts and rivers and pollution. And droughts has all this information under it. Maybe it's in its own chapter in the textbook. Um, rivers is another section with all this uh, with its information. Same thing with pollution, right? You would think, well, I'm going to learn everything about drought, then I'm going to learn everything about rivers, and then I'm going to learn everything about pollution. That is actually not the most effective way to learn it. The most effective way is to interleave those topics or subjects when you're studying. So what we're really looking at here is looking at aspects of droughts that are related perhaps to some of those aspects of rivers. And for instance, maybe something related to rivers that's related to pollution, things about pollution that's related to drought. So actually mixing things up. It can also be things cross topic. So for example, maybe you're studying something um, you know, related to um, something in psychology, but you also, you're going to be studying maybe in the same evening, you're going to be stu stu studying something, um, I don't know, related to geography and droughts. When you're studying psychology, whatever that might be, maybe it's social psychology and it's something about um, you know, um, compliance or, or obedience, whatever, and you know, you, you know you're going to be studying droughts, if you think about social psychology and then you find something in that chapter about drought, which is from a completely different class, and you connect that to what you're talking about and thinking about and learning in social psychology, and you connect what you're learning about in social psychology to that aspect of droughts in your geography class, you're going to remember them both better okay, than if you just focus on social psychology and then just focus on geography. And so strategies to do that, how do you do that? I mean, I've got a geography book, I've got a social psych text, what can I do? It's work. And I didn't mention this at the beginning, but in case you haven't figured it out, effective studying, effective learning is work. And when we're stressed, it can feel even like harder work than it normally is, which is another reason why it's important to try to mix things up, to try to make things interesting and fun and um, and also to make it a more positive experience. So for example, I'm going to study for 30 minutes and then I'm going to give myself, I'm going to eat a bowl of ice cream. 
okay? And so um, that, again, can help us stay alert. So strategies, creating thematic outlines instead of topical outlines. If you outline things, outlining is a good way to elaborate as long as you're not, you know, word for word or you're not copying an outline out of the textbook. Outlines are a good way to elaborate, but instead of topical, which would be like droughts and then this about droughts and this about droughts and this about droughts, think about it in terms of those sections headings being top being themes. Okay? So for example, um, a theme about stress, right? What am I learning about drought that's related to stress? What am I learning about aggression that's related to stress? What am I, you know, what am, in terms of pollution or, you know, group behaviors. So thematic outlines compared to topical outlines can be a really good way to do it. And if you haven't ever done thematic outlines before, that can be a challenge, granted. But remember, the easy way is not the best way. Remember that Goldilocks and the three bears sort of thing, right? A little bit of extra push, a little bit of extra stress is actually a good thing for learning. Drawing concept maps, um, actually drawing out how these different ideas are related to each other. Um, creating cross-topic examples or applications. So again, the example I gave um, about connecting maybe droughts to rivers or droughts to pollution or social psychology concepts to yeah. geography concepts um, can be a good way of doing it. Also, changing up the order in which you study things. So if you study rivers first and then droughts and then pollution, the next time you study, start with pollution and connect that to droughts and connect droughts to rivers. So keeping that order kind of um, um, different so your brain doesn't get lulled into this rut, which then lowers that level of kind of attention and, um, and, um, and also provides less challenge. Building those connections requires us to think about new and different ways to do that. So that's another way. So interleaving, layering things um, is a really good way of building those connections and providing those routes that are going to be more effective pathways. And again, when we're under stress and we're trying to get things back, the goal here is to have effective routes that we can follow, or if trying to get to something the way we would usually think about it or whatever we're trying to do just isn't working. If we've developed alternate pathways, we've got alternate ways around. If your usual route home, there's a tree down over the road, if that's the only route home, good luck. You're gonna to have to get out and walk. But if you know you've, you know, there are alternate ways to get home, maybe they're a little bit longer or you know, more convoluted, you've got an alternate way to get home, you can get where you wanna go. Semantic networks are the same way. So interleaving is another way of, um, of learning and, and encoding effectively. So let's think about, we talked about tests. Let's think about, you know, you've got a test coming up and you're going to have to study for that test. And you want to think about, you know, you maybe you're using elaboration, you're using, you know, leaving, whatever. But in terms of actual ways of studying, let's think about what might work. Hi. Doing all that. So, um, you good now? can you mute your microphone? Whoever's got your mic on? Um, so there we go. Thanks. Um, so if we're thinking about what works best, right? So one way of studying what I did. I'm not going to explain it to you because I don't want you to <laughs> One way of, of doing it, think about how you usually study for things, right? One way of doing it is to read something, maybe read the chapter, and then come back and read it again, and then read it again, and then read it again, or maybe go over your notes, read your notes again, read your notes again, or maybe take your notes, copy them, recopy them, recopy them. So, you, you know, you read and you reread and you reread. This is assuming, of course, you're doing it more than once. Okay, but you um, study it and then you study it again, you study it again. That's one way to study, right? Of course, and it's probably the most common way that people do it. Another way is to study it, say, okay, I know it. And then each time I study it, instead of going back and rereading everything or copying my notes again, I simply test myself. Maybe I just say, okay, what's everything I'm, you know, what are those, elab what are those strategies that, that, um, that she talked about last night? Okay. Um, what's a way of, of um, interleaving? What's the definition of, um, of elaboration? But each time what we're doing is instead of going back and just reading over our notes, we are testing ourselves. Each time that we study, we're actually self-testing. Maybe we're using Quizlet or we're using flashcards or we're just looking at, at a list of concepts um, that the textbook has. You know, here are the concepts for this chapter. And we say, okay, what's everything I know about this or what's everything I know about that? So that's another way to study, right? And then another way is to mix it. Study it, quiz yourself, go back and, I mean, read it, quiz yourself, read it, quiz yourself, read it, quiz yourself. So the question is, of those three, which one does the data tell us 
actually works the best. That is the one that produces the best learning and the best memory when we come to test time. Okay. Well, you picked A, you're wrong. If you pick C, you're wrong. What actually works the best is B. Okay. B is what is called retrieval practice. Sometimes it's called the testing to learn effect. What actually works the best is self-testing. Now, self-testing doesn't have to be a formal test where you write out a multiple choice test for yourself, although that would actually be effective and it would be a nice elaborative strategy to use. But self-testing actually is when you simply don't reread something and don't recopy your notes and don't read over your notes. What the data are really clear on okay, is that you need to initially read to learn the material, obviously. Okay? But once you know you've learned it, once you kind of have a pretty good eye feel for it, you've got a pretty good idea of what it is. And generally that means if you've read the chapter and you've actually paid attention to what you're reading, okay, then you have done that sufficiently. Any additional rereading is a waste of your time and a waste of your effort. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't continue to study. What you need to have in those sub subsequent study sessions is self-testing. And self-testing can take all kinds of forms, interesting forms. You can quiz yourself. You can ask yourself to summarize. You can explain it, like I said, to your imaginary eight-year-old or maybe to your study partner. You can draw it out. And I don't mean copying a drawing you've already created. I mean drawing it out again in a different way. Come up with examples. Don't memorize the examples and repeat them to yourself, but come up with new examples. Recreate what you have um, you know, learned before. And so um, again, one of the things that, um, that Aaron Bowie and I did um, some research on was actually looking at this kind of, uh, these effects of repeated testing with math in the case of Aaron. And we found the same thing, that when you do that repeated testing of yourself on math formulas, for example, um, then it didn't matter how you learned it in the first place, whether you read it, whether you copied it, once you knew that information, if you, learn, if you did your subsequent sessions by quizzing yourself, by saying, okay, let me see if I can write that formula down again, then um, you actually learned it better. The key here is once you quiz, go back and check your answers, but don't go back and reread the whole chapter or the whole set of notes. Just make sure that you've got the answers right. If you missed the answer, if you thought you got it right and you didn't, Make a mental note of that to yourself and be sure you quiz yourself on that, um, you know, again, fairly soon. Also, when you do those repeat testing sessions, just because you got it right doesn't mean you're off the hook. The research is really clear. It's called that if you drop that information out, like if you once you get it right, if you no longer quiz yourself on it or test yourself on it, you've lost the benefit for that information of retrieve of retrieval practice. So just because you get it right doesn't mean you leave it out for the subsequent sessions of testing. You might um, ask yourself in a different way, um, and, but to be sure that you're still right. So always repeat test all that information, not just what you missed. And that one of the reasons that retrieval practice works, think back to those semantic networks. When you have to think about an answer to a question, even a question you came up with yourself that builds retrieval routes. It strengthens ones that are already there. It refines alternate ones. You might find more effective, you know, um, strategies, more effective mediators to um, reach that target information and kind of prune out the ones that don't work so effectively. And so, um, so if you think about that, it um, is really important. And here's the really cool thing. The test that the kind of test that you give yourself don't have to match the kind of test you're going to have at the end, right? You don't have to try to second guess what kind of questions the teacher is going to give you, for example, or even, you know, whether they're multiple choice or short answer, or even the specific items in that chapter that that teacher is going to ask you about. If you're studying the and testing yourself on related information, then you're going to find that you're going to do better 
on the test, even if there's questions on that test you didn't specifically test yourself on, if they're related to what you tested yourself on, you're going to do much better. And so um, self-test benefits persist even under stress. This is some research, a lot of research has been done on this and um, including some research that I did with another one of my students, um, um, Sarah Lee. And we found that, that repeat testing, and we weren't using word lists or sentences. We were actually using very long and somewhat boring um, factual um, um, documents that people had to remember information from. And we found that when people learned it by self-testing, repeated self-testing, then um, those benefits persisted you know, um, at delay. And though we're not talking about learning it and then 10 minutes later you're tested on it, but several days later. So again, retrieval practice is another way of doing things. And you can think about that when you're interleaving, you can ask yourself questions like how is pollution related to drought, for example? Can I come up with a, a, a creative connection between those? That's self-testing, okay? Now, everything I've been talking about assumes that you're going to have more than one study session, right? And so, um, again, if we think about this, the most effective study schedule. So let's suppose this, what, you know, in terms of what would be most effective. One nice big long, let's say, five-hour study session cramming we might call that before the test the night before so i'm going to study and study and study for five hours i'm going to be good to go or five one hour sessions spaced out let's say over a week okay now again be honest what's the way you most frequently study i know it's probably the first one right well i don't wait till the night before i start two days before and so um the test is on friday so on wednesday i study for three hours and then on thursday i study for three more hours and then i have a test so i study for six hours over two days actually what you're describing is what's called mass practice cramming okay versus distributed practice which is scheduling things out over a longer period five hours in one session versus five one-hour sessions or 10 half-hour sessions over two weeks. And one of the things that we find is that mass practice cramming is actually really bad, <laughs> okay? Um, it's bad because it creates stress. If you're already under stress, it creates even more stress. Um, it sets you up for lots of interference. The brain doesn't have time in that five-hour session to organize things effectively, to build effective connections, to consolidate information, okay? So it doesn't allow for, um, for that kind of, of a thing either. And also, one of the things we know is that when you learn something and you study it, as soon as you stop studying it, it starts fading away. It just does, that's it. Brain says, not using it right now, it's, it's gonna fade away. So if you cram the night before and you're really good at midnight, eight hours later, 10 hours later, you're going to actually have lost a lot of that information and the cramming causes it to be lost even faster. If you're able to space things out over time, what you actually do is as soon as you stop studying on day one, sure, it starts fading, but then the next day when you start studying again, you haven't lost it all. You can kind of pick up and add to that. And again, that starts fading, but over time you've got the sum of these, of what you've done over those days and instead of cramming it all together. So that distributed practice, that spreading it out allows for opportunities for us to effectively elaborate, to interleave, to practice, retrieval practice. Now, that requires us to plan, right? It requires us to manage our time, which when we're under stress is hard anyway, but it's, it really does work effectively. One of the things that I tell students is really important is, you know, have a calendar, um, have a planner, and, um, and you put all kinds of things into your planner, like when is the test and when am I, you know, when is this assignment due? Um, when am I going, you know, when is, the, when is my birthday party going to be? And, and before COVID, we used to put all kinds of things in, like when is the, you know, when is, is the next football game, okay? Although we are having a virtual homecoming, you should put that into your calendar, okay? But what you also need to do is put those other things in there, like I'm going to study for, you know, on this day, for, at this time for 10 minutes or 15 minutes or, or whatever. The nice thing about spacing is it doesn't have to be a three hour session. It can be 15 minutes four times in one day, spread out. 15 minutes before a class, I'm gonna do a little studying of my social psych, even though the class I'm getting ready for is French. At the end of the day, you've got an hour's worth of studying done. 
And then the next day or the day after, you can do that as well and spread it out. So it also allows you to manage your time more effectively. It allows you to motivate yourself. And so again, hey, whatever works, baby, that's my, that's my mantra. So if there is a new episode of, of some show that you're really wanting to watch, use that as a reward, something to look forward to. I'm going to do my one hour of studying tonight, and as soon as I'm done with it, I'm going to watch that episode or I'm going to watch that movie or I'm going to do whatever it is that, um, you know, I really want to do. But knowing that you've got that as a reward is going to be helpful as well. And it keeps us alert because it kind of helps us to, um, you know, make those connections. So talked about um, several different strategies for trying to remember things. Take a moment and think about what were those four mentally? What were those four strategies? In any order, I don't care. So we had elaboration, we had interleaving, we had retrieval practice, and we had spacing. And if you know, you may or may not have noticed, but as I was doing this talk, um, I was using a lot of different ways to explain concepts. That's elaboration. I was also using images on the screen that were related to what I was talking about. I didn't have, you know, pictures of puppies and kittens, which are lovely, but I wasn't talking about puppies and kittens. I was using uh, images that were related to, um, or graphics that were related to what I was talking about. That's an example of elaborating and making connections to those, um, to alternate ways of representing things interleaving. I talked about elaborating, but then I talked about interleaving, and then I went back and connected it to elaborating retrieval practice. I connected that to interleaving. So that, again, is, um, is a way of doing those sorts of things, of pulling those topics that, granted, they're part of this talk, but each one of them is its own topic, connecting those. Retrieval practice, you may or may not have noticed, but throughout this talk, I would occasionally pause and ask you to remember something or think about a concept like what was that, that we talked about or what was this you know, particular um, concept that we just talked about. That's retrieval practice and um, asking about how that affected semantic networks. And spacing is kind of hard because again, this is one talk, so we couldn't you know, um, space it out. Although as Dr. Um, uh, Reif mentioned and, and we're, we are recording this and we will put this up on the department YouTube channel. Um, so if you want to watch it again, you certainly can. But one of the things that I did was I kind of talked about semantic networks and then about every other slide or so, you may not have noticed it because it was subtle, but I brought it back in again. And so I was using spacing as well. So all of those things, they're very doable strategies. They are things that are going to help us. They're going to build those networks. And the whole thing about having those semantic networks well built and effective built is that they help us get back to information effectively. They help us get back to what we're after um, efficiently. And when we're under stress, that can be a real game changer. So I've been asking the questions. Are there any questions that you have? And I guess Dr. Reif, you're monitoring the chat. So we'll you know, either do it in chat or if somebody wants to pipe up, however you guys want to manage it, I am all yours. Yeah, so actually, I'll, um, I'll go ahead and get us started here because I have a question. You've uh, outlined a number of different um, strategies, a number of different uh, approaches. If you had to choose one, Dr. Waddell, which one would it be? Just one. You can only choose one. Or is this unfair? Maybe it's unfair. No, no, no. I'm thinking. Okay. If I had to choose one, I would choose retrieval practice. And the reason I choose retrieval practice is because this, you're going to love this. It uses them all. Okay. Retrieval practice uses them all. Retrieval practice by thinking about ways of asking myself questions about the information. That is elaboration. In order to have effective retrieval practice, you have to do it more than once. That's spacing. And um, by, by pulling that information in of all those different things that I need to think about, about what might be on the test and how might I need to know this, that's interleaving. So I guess retrieval practice, that would be the one that I would, um, that I would choose. Yeah, if I could only do one because cheating, it uses them all. Yeah. Cheating, but a very good answer while cheating. I like that. Yes. Um, other thoughts? We'll put it to... Uh, to our uh, our guests here. Yeah, I, I actually had a question. 
Um, so very, uh, really quick question about, you mentioned the idea that, um, that sometimes things being a little bit harder is better. So uh, I guess the question is like, what's going on there? Why is it that we, there's a disconnect between uh, what we think works and what actually works? There's actually a theory, and I'm sure being a kind of psychologist, you know this, Dr. Cushion, um, that was um, proposed by Bjork called desirable difficulty. And the idea behind desirable difficulty is that hard, making things harder is actually a good thing. And, um, and the reason there are, you know, part of the aspect of that theory is that it really does, um, by making things harder, by challenging the, the brain, first of all, that e issue of difficulty creates that sort of arousal, that alertness that helps us focus. Um, but also difficulty is a sign that we're doing something different that we're not used to. And, um, and that again is um, something that, that we're using a strategy that we're not used to. And so um, also the, the notion of difficulty or of effort, um, again, is, is kind of related to that focusing of our attention, focusing of our task, uh, of our task performance and, um, and using, and then the, the brain can actually mark things sometimes too that are difficult as being important, right? If it's easy, big deal, no big deal. Difficult in, you know, learning about drought because it, perhaps because maybe it's a boring topic, but if I learn about it and I, and, and it, I do it in ways that are challenging, that can actually um, help mark it um, as being more important. And that can, be, that can be tagged in the brain. So there are a lot of reasons why um, difficulty and having things difficult um, is desirable. The key here, though, is not too difficult, right? If it becomes impossible, then we've lost our motivation. Um, we've lost our, you know, um, the ability to be successful. So again, it's that Goldilocks and the three bears kind of curve, you know, somewhere in there that's just right. And for different, for different ones of us, um, what is too difficult might, for one person might not be difficult enough for someone else. Um, but don't shy away from challenge. That's really the key here. Yeah. Excellent. Um, so we had a couple of additional questions. I'm going to, um, I, I think we may only have time for one. Um, so I'm going to go with the, uh, the first one. Um, and uh, it was in the chat, but uh, I'll go ahead and just restate it here. So we're on the same page. Um, how do learning approaches change throughout development? So for instance, there, is there an optimal strategy for grade school children that's less effective for college students? Um, so how has this sort of thing been observed in the field of developmental psychology? I know that's not your particular area of expertise in development, but certainly with respect to learning it is. So uh, right. what are your thoughts on that? Well, the interesting thing is that research on all of these has been done, um, you know, kind of across different age ranges. So for example, repeated testing has been done in middle school classrooms. Um, one of the, um, in fact, my dissertation advisor, Mark McDaniel, um, and uh, uh, did some work in St. Louis where they were actually going into middle school um, classrooms and working with uh, middle schoolers on learning um, uh, in biology and things like that. And so um, these strategies actually um, work, um, you know, all the way across the, the lifespan, young children, um, middle, you know, middle school, high school, young adults and older adults. Um, the degree to which um, the, the, they, that how we modify them, right, um, can can vary. But um, you know, um, I was watching a video the other day um, from a teacher in England who was actually did this video for um, what are called primary schools over there, which are like um, first and second graders, talking about using repeated testing and spacing to help first and second graders learn you know, really basic science concepts, for example. So the sophistication of those strategies is going to certainly vary. Um, we want to make things age appropriate, right? Um, but the, but um, and the, the amount of information that, that can be processed effectively is certainly, as, as people learn different strategies, is going to change. But one of the things about these strategies is it develops skills in organization, for example, elaboration and finding connections between things and articulating connections between things is a, is a learning strategy. And so when um, that, that as children that may not spontaneously use it. In fact, some of these strategies, people don't spontaneously use them. And we find that when they 
learn how to use them, including children, they become um, more effective at, at remembering that information. So yeah, I can't go into the exact, well, you know, between the ages of this and this, this is the effect versus this and that, because that isn't my area, obviously, as you point out. But, but one of the things I do know about the research is, you know, that, um, that these, these strategies are effective, um, you know, all the way up. Children that need to learn spelling words, whether the words they need to learn are, are things like mitten or, um, you know, something like homunculus, um, those kinds of strategies will apply just to different, different kind of layers or different levels of, of uh, complexity. Yeah. All right, excellent. Well, um, we do have a couple of additional um, questions, unfortunately, but uh, we're out of time. So um, I'll have to close it out right now. But I want to thank you, Dr. Wadil, for, uh, for uh, your talk this evening and uh, for uh, your tentative answer to the questions. And um, everyone, please do what Dr. Cushion suggested earlier. Give that reaction real quick, the, uh, the clap. Thank you. There we go. Thank you, Dr. Jordan. There we go. Yes. Uh, so thank you very much and uh, everyone have a, a good evening.